Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob. Let's draw Asuka Kazama. Asuka Kazama is a character from Namco's Tekken fighting game series. She was first introduced in Tekken 5 and has appeared in every iteration since then to this day. To start with, I'm drawing basic perspective guidelines because this is going to be a very perspective heavy drawing. It's going to be very dynamic. I want to really reinforce the sense of depth in this particular drawing. So. Now that I've got the lines marked out, start drawing the skeleton for the figure. You might notice I started with the center of the, uh, the waist. The reason for that being, I know that I'm going to have the camera sitting low, but I want to make sure that I get as much of the figure in view as I possibly can. So I start with the most central point of the figure that I possibly can, and branch out from there. It's a really simple skeleton. I'll make a video sometime in the future I'm going over it in more detail, but for now, um, what you see is what you get. So here, now that I'm satisfied with my joint placement, overall posing, I'm filling in the flesh. I'm using my basic knowledge of anatomy here, especially to figure out the deformations around the shoulder, how like the deltoid would bump up the way her arms are raised, the way the clavicles would sort of sweep up and around the neck, and the way with the lats would kind of flare out slightly. Reference is very helpful if you can't just think through this in your head, and even if you can't think through it, do like me, use reference anyway, it's always useful. Yeah, now you may have picked up that I was using a slight trick to make hands easier to draw. Um, if you've seen any videos of Jim Lee's appearances at Comic-Con, I'm um, using the technique that he's described there, I think in Comic-Con 2010. Again, in a future video I'll go over that as well, or you can look it up yourself. Here I'm erasing some of my construction lines and filling in major creases. Realized that backhand wasn't foreshortened enough, so I shrunk it down a bit. And here, cleaning up my lines a bit, trying to define a little bit more of the lat muscles versus where they meet the rib cage. Yes, she's going to be wearing clothing, but it still helps to figure all these things out, even if you're going to draw clothes even loose fitting clothes over your character because it's the shape of the body that defines the shape of the clothing so you have to figure out the body first and then the clothing. This is actually why a lot of your superheroes tend to wear spandex, it just becomes easier.
Now I rotated the canvas slightly there. I knew when I started this painting that it was going to have a canted view, slightly tilted camera. But that would have been a complete pain to try and do all of this perspective with that extra added angle. So I did everything flat first so that I could just simply block out these lines, get my perspective set up, and then I cant it to, to get the dramatic effect, to emphasize the sense of movement and the sense of depth in this drawing. It's actually a film technique, but really it, painting, film, it's all just visual arts, so you can borrow a lot of the same techniques. Typically, if you want a drawing to have a very dynamic feel to it, you want to include a lot of diagonal lines. If you want something to feel very peaceful and very solid, conversely, you would use a lot of vertical and horizontal lines. So for a shot like this, where you have a character striking martial arts pose, and you have a very significant foreshortening, you have a lot of depth, depth in the scene, to pull that off, you really want to have diagonal lines to sort of emphasize that, that sense of movement, the sense of action. There. I blocked out some very basic colors and tones for the background using the gradient tool. I use this a lot. It just offers a very quick way to, to get out large swaths of color without having to spend too much time in the painting. Right now I'm using Krita 2.7, which is still an experimental Windows version, so from time to time stability problems kick in and it'll take me to desktop. Thankfully though, Krita is very generous with its autosave, so I never find myself losing more than maybe one to two minutes worth of work. It's irritating, but understandable. And still, open source software can't beat that price. So, I would still say that even with the occasional crash or two, Krita is a very, very good alternative to Photoshop. And in many ways, it actually surpasses Photoshop in that, well, usability is, is very good. Krita is nice about getting out of your way so you can simply paint, which is understandable. Photoshop is not really a painting tool per se, it's Photoshop. It's meant for shopping photos. Now here, I'm blocking out the city with some basic tones, basic colors. I'm not spending too much time to make sure it's really solid because I'm going to fill in the other colors later on. This is just to get an overall tone blocked out so that I can sort of get a grasp in my head of what the scene is going to look like, what I'm going to do. It's very difficult to work with a completely blank canvas, so if you're not sure what you want to do with something, just throw a spattering of color on there. Sometimes you get happy accents. And if nothing else, the extra layers of color as you paint over various parts, change your mind, revise, eliminate something, bring it back, all of those extra changes will leave some remnant behind and give your painting a little bit more tone, a little more grit and life, as it were. So that way you get a more lived in, a more painterly feel. If that's what you're going for, if you're striving for hyper-realism, this rule doesn't really apply. But then, I've always found hyper-realism to be less exp It has less expression, I would say, than the more surrealistic, the more impressionistic painterly style. I feel like with hyperrealism, something gets lost. The soul of the painting, if you will, is missing. And here. I'm just cleaning it up a little more, making sure I get bounce light, reflected light. I want to try and give some indication that the sun is setting off to the right here, and that all these buildings are covered in glass, reflecting light down into the city streets below. So there's some sh shadow, some shading going on. 
but overall it's it's filled with this bounce delight. So I'm using different values that I picked up with the eyedropper from different parts of buildings. I'm using one part of a building on a completely different side of the street, things like that, just to give it more varied colors, more varied tones, to help spread out these colors so that it feels more like there's a lot of light bouncing around. And by sampling roughly the same color all around, I'm keeping my colors unified. Because in real life, yes, these buildings might be made of all different materials, they'll have different architectural plans, you name it. So they should all be different colors. That's only if they're viewed under pristine white light. But in reality, the lighting here is going to come from the sun. It's going to be natural diffused light.
A useful thing to keep in mind when you're painting the face is that there are no truly hard edges, even on men. So no matter how chiseled the features, no matter how grizzled the individual you're trying to paint, there's never actually a truly hard edge. And even if there was, let's say somebody, some kind of mutant, who knows what, vampire, whatever, even if the edge is a perfect 90 degree, which that should never happen, let's hypothetically say that it did. The way that light plays across flesh will never make it appear that way. Light coming through flesh is actually absorbed and bounces around just beneath the surface and then comes out in a totally different direction. And that's just one facet. Sometimes light will actually hit flesh, go two layers down, bounce off of that. Or it'll come in at a glancing angle and be refracted in a completely different incident angle. So all of that is to say that when light hits your flesh, it actually does what's called subsurface scattering and doesn't really come out as it would when it hits, say, plastic or something to that effect. It's never, it'll never bounce perfectly clear off at the same angle that it hit. There's always a lot of bouncing reflecting and absorbing color off of the blood pulsing beneath the surface, so there's all kinds of different tones, all sorts of different shadows that happen off of that, but the easiest way to think of it is that there are never any hard surfaces. So every shadow on the face or any part of your skin should be rendered as a soft, subtle gradient. Even wrinkles are never actually truly craggy. So if you find that you're having trouble painting faces, just try and keep that in mind. There are no harsh shadows. Another neat trick that actually may be pretty noticeable in this one is that on parts of the skin that are full of capillaries or very close to a bone, the ruddy color of the blood flowing beneath the skin's surface comes through. So on the nose and the cheekbones, there's a lot of... I, I added a bit more red than the other parts of the face. With the uh, more see-through, more transparent, less thick parts of the head, like the ears, if they were visible, there was a source of light behind or slightly adjacent to it. There would also be flooded with this fleshy red color. Because in real life, this is what we would see, and these are visual, visual cues that people pick up on.
struggled quite a bit with her chest wrappings. The difficult thing about an impractical costume is that, by definition, there's no practical way to think through it. This particular costume for Asuka was actually designed by um, someone outside of Namco. It was just a special one-off that eventually got incorporated in. There was really only one piece of concept art for it. And it was that piece of concept art that allowed this costume design to work. It was rendered in a very specific way from a very certain angle. So those those wrappings on her chest were just a bear to deal with. I looked up cosplayers, looked at their solutions to the problem. And really, when you bring something like that into the real world, the only way to solve it is to completely change the silhouette and overall look of, of the piece. So, I tried my best to split the difference, but I'm still not really satisfied with the solution I have. The topology just makes no sense with those wrappings. There's no way that that could actually work. But anyway. tried to create really strong specular highlights with the kimono, my thought being that it was likely made out of silk, so silk tends to be very, very shiny. It's almost like hair in that it has a dual specular highlight, which are really just increasingly brighter in tones of the base color. In this case, I made it subtly red. Filling in the sash and the OB with the same color. I find that with really flowing pieces like this, with the sash, that the best way to add energy and life to it is to have a soft sweeping line followed by a harsh angle, then another soft sweeping line and harsh angle. You may notice in some of my other pieces that I do this with hair floats. I found that this is really, for me, the best way to bring out a sort of life and flowing, a sort of flowing look and energy really to these pieces. If you make them too straight then it doesn't seem very billowy, but if you make it too curvy then it seems like it's made out of taffeta or some really wavish material. When you have a long sweeping curve and then one sharp angle and then another long sweeping curve, it sort of splits the difference. It's, it's almost like the 50-50 cotton polyester. So I tend to use it quite a bit. Now here I figured it was the same silkish material. So I again did a there for the highlight on the flesh of her leg sampled the same highlight color off the nose, which is actually the same highlight color as the sky. Your highlights will typically be whatever your sky is. If you look carefully at the face, the sclera of her eyes, the white, reflects the overall sky color. It's not actually white. This is a mistake that I see a lot of people just starting out make. They figure, oh, it's the white of the eyes, so it must be white. No, just use your environment color. Just use what's in the sky. It'll look natural. It may not seem intuitive, but it works. <laughs> 